We'll start the uh, presentation tonight. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all to um, the Michigan Residential Net Zero Energy Conference and welcome you to the uh, envelope uh, technical topic, wall systems. And this is with, uh, and you also tour, as you'll see, Paul is in a net zero home, so we'll get a little tour of that. And the two presenters will be Mark Miller, an architect, and Paula Buba, who is a builder. And let me introduce first uh, Mark Miller. He is a Chicago-based architect. Um, has been a champion of energy efficiency and sustainability uh, since he started in 1982, uh, studying solar architecture at the University of Arizona. He has been uh, designing energy efficient residential projects and like commercial interiors in his own office since uh, 1998. He's always trying to push the envelope. Each new residence exceeds the prior benchmarks for energy efficiency and environmental sensitivity. Uh, he is active in promoting a paradigm shift in how we build. Mark is a founding member of the Passive House Alliance Chicago chapter and served a two-term, two-year term as the executive director of Passive House Alliance US. Uh, welcome, Mark. Uh, please proceed. Thank you, Dave. Um, here we go. So happy to be here. Um, we have been working on this project for several years now and uh, excited to finally be able to share it with folks. Uh, we're all very proud of it. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I like to work uh, in my architectural practice with the theme of flow, which means that I like to use curves uh, in the projects that I design. And since 2011, um, I got involved in the Passive House uh, world, and I've been to many of the conferences, and at each conference, I was always seeing uh, every project that was being presented, you know, they were square passive houses or rectangular passive houses, and, uh, you know, my sensibilities wanted to say, hey, how come we can't do a round passive house? And uh, I'm happy to tell you that I think, as far as I know, this may be the first round passive house in all of North America. So can we have a hallelujah? <laughs> um, so I started with uh, conceptually a circle and a circle energetically, you know, contains the energy. Um, but I was hoping to have open up the circle into two halves and offset them so that it allows for new things to come into the circle and it also relates better to things that are outside of the circle. So now the energy of the outside and the nature of outside could come into the home as well as the interior of the home starts to come out of the home. This shape also uh, you'll notice that the curves of the outside wall start to become the curves of the inside of the wall. So experientially, this line between what's outside and one inside starts to blur. And unlike rectangular homes, uh, with a home with this shape, you can start to see the outside of your house while you're still inside of it. So it sets up this nice indoor-outdoor continuity. And also the two flat walls on the outside of the house are what announces the two entries to the home. Now, to me, good design, good architectural design for a home uh, is successful if the home radiates the spirit of its owner. And uh, this home is definitely a statement for the values of the homeowner, which are championing energy efficiency, and eco-friendly building. And we're hoping that this is kind of a flagship um, for the surrounding community and larger Michigan community as a uh, way to build at a much higher performing level than traditional construction. Uh, this shape also picks up the theme of uh, spiritual energy. And uh, I like to think that like a wind turbine catches the wind, that the shape of this home conceptually is also allowing energy 
to come into the home. So those were some of the artistic goals for the house. And uh, the main goals that I was presented with of a net zero and a passive house home, when I first came to the site, seemed challenging. Um, the first thing I noticed was that there's a lot of tree cover on this site. And as you can see from the shading on the photo on the left, uh, quite a bit of the surface gets shaded from solar radiation. The second thing that I noticed is that the lake, with us being on the south shore, the lake views are to the north and northeast. And so obviously as an architect, I'm interested in wanting windows to the views of the lovely lake that we're next to but the windows are to the north and the solar radiation I wanna pick up tells me that the windows I want wanna to be to the south. So um, it was a bit of a challenge to reckon these two opposing um, factors of the site, um, but I think we came to the right balancing point um, between these things with our home design. So the first floor has its public spaces, the kitchen, the dining room, the living room, the master bedroom, all on the side of the house that will take advantage to the views to the lake, to our north and to the northeast and east, and other more utilitarian functioning rooms, the utility room, the walk-in closet, the powder room, the foyer, are to the south to allow the other rooms to have the view. So when we look at it, uh, we see the blue arrows are showing us the views and the yellow arrows are showing us our solar radiation. And when we move upstairs, we see that now we start to have many more south facing windows to pick up our solar heat gain. And we still have all the wonderful spaces taking advantage of the views to the north and to the northeast. The home is also designed for aging in place. So the master bedroom and kitchen and dining room are all on the first floor. And um, should things happen um, later in life where a wheelchair came into the story, um, we have the ability where there are no steps, you know, everything is wheelchair friendly. And I'll show you in a second that we have a lift in the basement. So the house originally had a detached garage. So the main house had a crawl space. Our solar array to reach net zero was gonna be on the slanted roof of the garage structure. And we were planning on using some vertical axis wind turbines on the house. As we researched the wind turbines and talked to a lot of different people, we, we started to learn that the reliability of these devices were not as we were hoping, and we were concerned, you know, one failure and having to spend the money to go up and repair that turbine would probably undo any of the energy savings that would be provided. So um, the owner requested also that uh, the idea of having to walk with two handfuls of groceries in the middle of winter from the detached garage to the house was not sounding so appealing any longer. Um, so the request came to put the garage into the basement of the home. And so that meant the detached garage could go away and our solar array now would be hovering over the ramp leading down to the entry to the garage. So now we have a new garage level, and the goal here was to not to, to keep uh, as little of the square footage as possible of this new third level to the home outside of our thermal envelope, so that it wouldn't exacerbate uh, or or make it more difficult to reach our net zero goals. So as you can see, the thick wall around the stairwell. Uh, is our thermal envelope and everything outside of that um, is is not. You'll also notice that in the center of the home uh, there is a closet for storage and then should it ever become needed we've designed for an elevator to be installed later uh, to get one up to the first floor. 
So here's a section cut through our house. We can see now the full uh, garage lower level. Uh, we've minimized the condition space. And now here is the yellow representing our thermal boundary. So we cover the first and second floor and then just a portion of the lower level garage. Our ceilings are at an R94, our walls are at an R54, and our floor separating the garage from the first floor is at an R56. We're using an Elpin triple pane window throughout the home that are tilt and turn style for high performance. And the entry doors, we're using a Provia product um, that actually has four panes of insulated glass Krypton filled to help, help us with our nice um, super insulated wall assembly. The other nice thing about the way we uh, just enclosed the stairwell um, into our boundary is that we saved a ton on not using foam insulation board around uh, you know, six inches of foam typically on passive houses that have basements that are insulated and the basements in the thermal envelope. So we were able to eliminate um, quite a volume of this type of material, which we were happy about. So our strategies for the window also used high gain windows uh, throughout the home, but where the sun angle would be low, we switch to a, a slightly different um, solar heat gain coefficient. So you can see there on the east windows, um, we implement that change in the west window at the kitchen as well. So then this becomes our condition space. So this is, we've been working with the Passive House Institute US. They'll be the ones certifying um, our passive home. And you know they put you through quite a rigorous uh, process um, where all the drawings are analyzed, all the details are analyzed, and you have to do this pretty extensive um, woofy passive model of the home. And uh, we see that we have about 2,300 square feet of floor area in our envelope and about 19,800 of net volume. So um, passive house is about trying to minimize the amount of heating and cooling energy that leaves the envelope. So if you see the, the graph on the left that we're, we're losing the most heat throughout the months through our windows followed by the walls and our ventilation system is third and just small amounts of loss from the ground and the roof because of our super insulated envelope. So what do we gain to offset all of these losses? Well, we have internal gains on the right uh, from our body heat, from cooking, from appliances and electronics running throughout the day. And whatever is left over to get us to balance out with our losses has to come from our mechanical equipment. So if you take away one thing from our presentation today, it's this, that Passive House and Net Zero is all about minimizing our losses so that we have to minimally replenish what has escaped. And that makes for the easiest path to a Net Zero project. So now let's look at some of the main um, MEP systems that we incorporated in our project. So first to determine where was the best place to put our solar array with so many trees, we did a SketchUp model and we modeled the heights of the trees and put them in the proper location with the home. And you're seeing here the original design with the detached garage. But if we follow the shadows cast by the trees, we were able to learn that the spot with the most solar radiation was going to be just to the west of our home structure. And that's where we located our array. We were able to take down a few trees um, that needed to come down anyways, and we saved that material. And uh, it's going to be used for mainly for the flooring throughout the house. 
So the array originally was mounted over the retaining walls of the driveway leading down to the garage. And we are also incorporating in our 12 kilowatt array um, a couple of Tesla power walls to store that solar energy. And we recently just changed the drive retaining walls now from concrete to actually using these natural boulders. And so the array, as you can see, is going to be in the sunny spot just beyond the boulders. For our heating and cooling system, we're using what's very popular for many passive houses these days is a mini split system. And originally we had two smaller units, one for the first floor, one for the second floor. But we noticed that the static pressure on these units were, um, were a little bit limiting. And uh, just for peace of mind, we wanted to make sure that the system had enough push. Um, we changed to a single uh, unit, a downflow unit um, that had a more powerful fan uh, so that we were sure we weren't going to have any problems. And that also allowed us to combine the first and second floor duct work instead of it being on two different levels of the home. Now all the duct work runs within the second floor floor assembly or uh, some of it, the trunk line runs in a, in a soffit that is in the um, hallway of the middle of the house. For our fresh air system, we are using the Serve 2, which is um, just a really impressive unit. Uh, not only is this our energy recovery ventilator, um, but it also can condition the air as well. So we get a little heating boost and we get a little cooling boost as needed that this unit could do. The other thing that we incorporated was an accessory they have. It's the Geo Boost, which is a small box that has a heat exchanger in it. And we have a glycol loop that before we backfilled, we ran around the foundation of the home. And so we get a 15 to 20% boost in efficiency with our serve two unit. And there are many times during the year when our heating and cooling unit doesn't have to turn on at all, that the heat that's stored in the ground, you know, usually around 50 degrees, that we can use that temperature um, to help heat and cool the home virtually for free, just for the energy to run the pump and the fans. Um, but it also in the extreme parts of the season, in the middle of winter, in the middle of summer, uh, that 50 degree temperature also helps buffer down the incoming outside air that's going to be filtered and distributed throughout the house for our superior indoor air quality. Uh, you know, we can take zero degree air and um, run it through the geo boost. And instead of introducing such cold air into the home, it's actually going to raise the temperature to, to be closer to the indoor air temperature. So it's a really interesting sophisticated product and we're excited to see it uh, being put to use here now for hot water we actually had a lot of discussion on what to do for hot water uh, originally you know the thought was to use an on-demand hot water system um, but these take a tremendous amount of energy to keep up with the demand, especially if you have um, two people using two different bathrooms or someone's in the kitchen washing dishes. Um, you know, it takes a lot of energy to keep up with that demand. Also, since this is a net zero passive home, you know, we decided not to have a gas hookup for this home. It's all electric so that um, we are stopping carbon emissions in the operation of our home and uh, it turns out that the electric versions of these on-demand systems have a harder time keeping up with demand and as i was researching more and more was, was we're seeing many comments that the electric models of these units um, would need to be replaced after three to five years so again you know to have uh, an appliance um, needing to be replaced so early um, didn't seem to make sense because, again, having to purchase a new unit would undo all the energy savings uh, over the life of the, this 
the appliance. So we settled on a um, heat pump water heater, um, which had a nice rebate for its purchase. And um, we calculated that the payback with energy savings would be very short, two to three years. So this seemed to be the item that made the most sense for our particular project. We are locating that unit under the stairs in our little utility room. And we strategically decided to place our two Tesla Powerwall batteries inside the same utility room. You know, the way these um, heat pump units work is that they take BTUs from the air and they put it into the water and the, um, the unit spits out cool air. So, um, you know, wherever we can um, benefit from appliances that are um, radiating heat from their operation, this, um, um, this unit is happy to take those BTUs and convert it into hot water for you. So, um, you know, that system's working really well. So then I also wanted to share with you um, some imagery from the job site. And, you know, we were really pleased with how the forms were looking on paper. But one of the most heartwarming things to see was as the home was being constructed, you know, there's some just really beautiful um, images um, that uh, we knew we really had a winner on our hands when we started to see things like this. And you can see, if you look in the center circle of the home, the square there is our removable floor um, for the optional lift. So we were also lucky that um, the uh, son of my client had a friend with a drone and they came out a few times uh, during construction and they've given us some really spectacular um, views of the house under construction. You can see the stairs in the center of the home. This is the second floor floor framing. You can see the double stud wall that Paul's gonna tell you about um, there in the living room, two story space. So it's probably around the same time of year looking at the colors of the trees. There's our lake view. Now here we're outside the two-story living room space. And if you look over this last window on your left, as the camera rolls through, you will see how we manipulated the structure to get a, a duct chase that runs the length of the home for our mechanical system. Our zip sheathing for air tightness. And you can see we used TGAIs on the half of the house that's closest to you. And you'll notice the main beam line between the two half circles, it's below the joist on the left and the joist on the right, it bumps up to be in line. This is all part of our strategy for routing mechanicals and plumbing. And then we're using um, floor trusses uh, on the farther side, uh, which allowed the dining room, living room, kitchen, uh, all to have a nice smooth flat ceiling without any bump downs. The last view here, this is, well, we have half of the attic floor now in place and sheathed. Looking down at the stairwell. Our double stud wall in the living room. All right, so um, we are now going to uh, turn it over to Paul, and he is going to walk you through the construction of various assemblies, the floors and walls, working our way up to explain to you some of the important detailing to get 
our super air tightness in our highly insulated wall systems. And if you have Thank any you, questions, <laughs> you're welcome. You can reach us at these email addresses. Thanks, David. Thank you, Mark. That was wonderful. Um, so now we see the second part of this. Uh, Paul Abubas uh, is with Abuba Builders, a design construction company out of Kalamazoo. Paul has his BS, Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Science from the Western Washington University's Huxley College. He's been involved in residential construction for the past 16 years. Uh, his company is dedicated to the construction of exceptionally efficient, environmentally conscious, universally designed homes. And their company has completed several LEED certified gold projects based upon a double stud wall design and is also working currently on uh, Mark's project here. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, David. Uh, let's get this up and running. So. Okay, so um, for the, we're starting with the foundation here. Uh, and so while although this house is round, most of the techniques we use to build high performance homes are common to all of my company's homes. So generally in all our designs, we start with a typical foundation. We use uh, eight, eight inch concrete walls on eight inch by 16 inch footings. And then we insulate the exterior of the foundation using extruded, extruded polystyrene foam. On this particular house, the garage is not part of our passive envelope, but we wanted to make it sort of a semi-conditioned space. We also had some concerns about condensation potentially in the garage. So we went ahead and at least insulated this to an R10 level. Um, we also insulated the slab with extruded polystyrene. Once again, here we put an R10 below the slab. So the framing um, in this house is, is primarily a garage. And only, as Mark mentioned, only the inner round area is conditioned space. Uh, this is where we have the mechanical room, the stairs, and an area designed for a platform lift in the future. Um, one thing we do in order to meet fire codes and isolate the wall system from the floor cavities uh, in creating this airtight assembly um, is that we use a ceiling backer that you can see in this detail here that joins our two interior and two uh, walls of the interior and exterior side, the double stud. So what happens is, is that we seal the exterior side with the zip sheathing that you'd seen in a couple of the photos from before. And, but we also do a sort of belt and suspenders approach and apply an airtight drywall approach to seal the interior. So that the result is, is that the insulated cavity is a completely sealed system. Uh, the wall system is sealed independently of the floor system, which is sealed independently of the above grade walls, which is sealed independently of the uh, attic. Uh, this photo here kind of shows that sealing back backer in greater detail. Um, we extend that ceiling backer out so that that gives us a solid surface uh, to later attach the drywall to and make sure that that is sealed as well. So this is actually current uh, video footage of the home, um, of the garage. So as you can see, I'm walking through the area right now that where the car turner that Mark mentioned would be. Uh, we're coming around the back. There, in this back corner here, there is actually a FEMA rated uh, tornado shelter that has been incorporated into the design as well. The core of the house here now is, as you can see, has been sealed to both sides. Uh, this room here would be the elevator, sh future elevator shaft um, at what time we wanna add a platform lift and the curved stairwell taking us up into the main floor and entering the great room. So 
So that takes us to the above grade walls. So once we have the floor system complete, we proceed by platform framing the above grade walls. Uh, the same technique that was used to frame the basement walls is used here. Uh, we apply a continuous bead of sealant um, between the subfloor and the bottom plates before standing the sections of wall. And we also use continuous beads of sealant as applied between the top plates and the ceiling backers that are shown. Uh, so once again, as I mentioned, making a completely contained, sealed, uh, insulated assembly. So in order to make the exterior sheathing uh, completely air sealed, uh, it involves a lot of sealant. Uh, our preferred method is to use acoustical sealant. So the sheathing in the field uh, would be taped. So all those joints are taped. But anywhere where the sheathing would end, like say for instance around a window opening or a door opening or at the bottom plate or at the top plate where the sheathing ends needs to be sealed to the framing. And so one of my guys, Todd, here has shown an example of sealing a window. Um, in addition, the windows where any opening, window or door opening, where we have to penetrate through the double stud layer, we have to do what we call bucking it. So there will be pieces of sheathing that will surround the entire opening. We also need to make sure that that is airtight as well. So we apply beads of sealant underneath all those areas. Here's an example of us tying those walls together. Uh, we will straighten them out and get everything pulled together to hold our geometry. There's an example of applying the ceiling backer. It serves the same purpose too. In addition to air sealing the uh, top of the assembly, it also provides a fire break as well as additional structure. So in the end, the only parts that would where we have thermal bridging through the assembly occur at these fire breaks, which are only three quarters of an inch thick. Um, so that would be at the fire break and at the uh, framing or the subfloor layer as well. This is an example of us preparing the window openings for uh, prior to the installation of the windows. In some cases with the particular design of this house, it becomes difficult to make it so that all the areas that we need to insulate can be accomplished uh, at the final when we go to do the dense pack cellulose. So what we're showing here is an example of us taking care of these details during the assembly of the walls and adding a little bit of insulation in places where we would not be able to access later on down the line. So this is a current walkthrough taken today. This we are entering the front door and into the foyer. This is an entry closet. And next to this over here on the side, there will be a bench seat with some hooks for some jackets. To the right here will be a half bathroom. And this area in the ground here coming up on the left is actually, for now, it probably just sort of a place to display smart, but it actually serves as where the platform lift would come up through the floor if we add it in later. It's the dining room. The great room. And this area will be our kitchen. The 
The area here off to the side of the kitchen is the lawn room. The dryer, washer, and a utility sink will be placed along this wall. And then also in this room, we have a sub panel of electricity that will be all the backed up or uh, portions of the system and a multimedia center for all the connections for our uh, cable and telephone. So that is that same view uh, with all the drywall stripped away. So in this uh, photo here, you can see how we've managed to create a curved balcony uh, that is freely, that is supported by only two structural steel rods uh, and also incorporate, as Mark mentioned before, all the uh, heating and cooling ductwork and hit it in there. Uh, there's also some other details you might notice up in the ceiling. Uh, we needed to separate the ceiling into uh, cells that we could insulate. When we go to dense packet, we can't just keep blowing the cellulose insulation there forever. It would, without any resistance, it would be very difficult to um, attain the densities and be consistent about the insulation. And so that's what that, that detail there is. This is walking into the master bedroom. the adjacent master bath with a zero clearance entry shower. The toilet will be tucked back in the corner and the vanity will be placed along this wall. And off the back side of the bathroom is the master closet. You will notice that this is not a particularly large house. Uh, that's in keeping in line with the greener is generally smaller and easier as far as uh, attaining our passive house goals in terms of uh, heating and cooling structure. This is our stairway to the second floor. The openings that you see along the left-hand side will actually be a finished bookcase that will follow the curve of the stairs. The stairs will also remain as an open riser system. So even once we wrap the finished wood around those uh, sub treads, you will still be able to see through that. The area here on the left is a project area. There will be a spot over here just to be able to sit and read a book and enjoy the views of the lake. And the area directly ahead will be an office area. There will be desks and uh, some storage uh, for placing a computer and all the uh, associated things. This is the guest bedroom. And this area is our secondary mechanical room. Our mini split air handler, our uh, ERV unit will all be placed in that room. It's a guest bath. The vanity will be placed in this first portion. And once you enter the back, there will actually be a tub, toilet, and the tub has a rain shower head. And this area has been referred to as the game room. We've set it up with a 7.1 theater surround and there will be uh, 
basically a just good place to hang out and, and spend some time with the kids. Eventually, uh, there is a patio that will be constructed out there. This is a view of the finished framing of the office area from the interior. It allows you to see the double studded wall structure and see what all the, uh, what goes into the behind the drywall. The bags that you see on the window is something very interesting. Um, Alpin, the manufacturer of these windows is producing these windows at uh, up in Colorado. Um, so they put the bags to help equalization of pressure within the windows so that when they're shipped to either higher or lower elevations, they can be allowed to acclimate. Eventually the bags are clipped off. There's, they're attached to, uh, to the gas chambers between the glass uh, by a breather tube that is connected to this bag. And it, uh, after sufficient accl acclimatization, uh, that's clipped off and then uh, the breather tube is sealed and just stuffed behind the, um, the weather strip on the glazing. So I often get asked about all the various types of uh, sealants and tapes and what's necessary to create a passive house level of air tightness in a home. And actually for us, we prefer, there's a lot of expensive materials out on the market, but we really keep this pretty simple. And we've had a number of houses now, all of them achieving passive house levels of air tightness. So we feel pretty confident in them. Over a year and nothing has changed about it. So I feel pretty confident in the longevity, at least the, in the short term of these particular um, sealants and tapes. We rely, as I mentioned before, uh, pretty heavily on the acoustical sealant. That's shown here is the OSI SC-175. Um, it's a low VOC water-based uh, acoustical sealant. Um, we use that anywhere that will be in between components. So in between sheathing and framing, in between framing and subfloor, we tend to use the quad sealant when we're putting in windows. Uh, so anywhere that's a typically two caulked joint that will have exposure to weather. Um, all of the, since we're using zip sheathing, we utilize their tapes and liquid flashing materials where applicable. The 3M weather tape we find to be a very good tape for sealing uh, other materials like OSB uh, together that aren't necessarily zip. It also tends to work very well in the cold weather. Sometimes we have very awkward to seal penetrations. And in those cases, we rely on the gaskets that you see in the foreground and flashing panels. Uh, this one's made by a company called Quick Flash. And we use that on sealing the mini split line sets that are run for our heating and cooling system. And on the very left are some electrical boxes that are produced by a company called Airfoil. We really like these boxes. I can't say enough about them. They provide a very solid flange to which a completed bead of sealant can be placed when installing the drywall to ensure that they're airtight. They also additionally have a little pocket um, in which you inject some foam after everything's been wired to completely seal off the wiring penetrations. Here's an example of us sealing the top edge of the sheathing to the subfloor, which represents the top air barrier of the attic floor. And here's an example of us using one of those flashing uh, gaskets to seal a silcock. In some cases, when we're trying to do the airtight drywall approach, there's some awkward penetrations that need to be dealt with. Um, this is our mechanical room on the second floor of this house. And there's a lot of ductwork up there for ventilation uh, that we need to be able to seal. In those cases, we typically will cut ourselves a piece of three quarter inch subfloor material and then tightly fit the penetrations through it and seal them up uh, with quad sealant. Um, we also, after the drywall, this gives us a good surface area for the drywall to be glued to. And additionally, we can go back at finish after the drywall's in and add additional sealant too to ensure that we get a really good seal around those penetrations. Here's another example. You can see the use of the airtight electrical boxes. You will also notice that 
once again, where we have plumbing in an exterior wall, we put a rather large piece of subfloor material to allow us to seal around those pipe penetrations. So once we've got everything framed up and got the outside done, we apply a layer of insole web. And then in this case, because of the nature of the curved wall, we needed to strap it to make sure that we could have it hold its shape of the curve. And then this layer, that whole double studded wall assembly is filled with dense packed cellulose. I'm afraid we're about out of time. That's it for me. Yeah. Um, do we have time for questions here? First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mark and Paul for this wonderful presentation and about this marvelous circular passive house. I think what we're gonna have to do is, maybe John can clue me in on this, is uh, the next presentation will be on. Can we get one question in here? That'd be great. Mark, okay, good. We're all ready for a question. Yeah, yeah I don't see any questions in the box. No questions in the box. Okay. Well, I thought we'd allow a little time. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mark. That's a marvelous house. I would never, ex all these passive houses, I've never seen them with any curves like that. And uh, it's just sort of amazing how much insulation and efficiency you can get in such a house. So thank you. Thank you all for. Uh, presenting tonight and uh, just to remind you that there's also a, a session um, a networking session later on at 8 30 and uh, there may be some uh, time to talk uh, ask questions of uh, the presenters at that time also so I give it to David Gard and who will be doing our next uh, introductions thank you Paul thank you Mark greatly appreciate thank it you, David.